great to have everybody here tonight. I'm glad to see that you all are interested in learning more about various de-studying topics. Tonight's speaker uh, is Colin Lennox here, who's been having a friendly chat. Uh, he is the CEO of Eco Islands LLC. Uh, they specialize in biological water treatments. Um, and are uh, working on various bioremediation, uh, especially with a focus on uh, mining and leftovers from uh, various um, developments related to resource extraction. So I'll uh, go ahead and let Colin get started. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Carly. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for, for being here with us tonight. Uh, so. Uh, we're going to be talking about essentially permaculture and seasteading and wetlands. We'll talk a little bit about what is a wetland, what good is a wetland, what are some of the services that wetlands provide, uh, and we'll do a little summation at the end and then of course some, uh, some Q&A. Um, so just uh, let me get started. Let me go ahead and share the screen. Matt, can you see it? Uh, yes, I can. Awesome. Okay, so uh, wetland cycling, uh, the final component in sustainable seasteads. Looks like I missed the question mark here, and that's what we're going to try to answer. Um, quick shout out then to uh, uh, Matt Lemitz, uh, who is, uh, uh, thank you once again for the introduction. Matt, uh, Steli J. Ford, and um, James Parsons, uh, friends and uh, co-science consultants of, of mine, uh, we're all working together. Uh, to design a system for the sea pods and ocean builders. Uh, it's not a done deal yet. We're still kind of in the early stages, but we approached them. And uh, they were also kind enough to, uh, through Connor and Craig uh, with um, sea pods uh, or ocean builders uh, to give us permission to uh, use some of their, their imagery. So if you haven't checked out ocean builders yet, wow. Uh, they are arguably the farthest along towards practical seasteading that I at least have, have come across. Short of people who've been living on their boats for years and years. That's, that, that, that's one form of seasteading. Their, their version here is significantly different and not, we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but we're looking at building uh, some of our wetland technologies into some of their, their systems, their sea pods. Uh, so just wanted to get that out there first. Uh, okay, that's not the button. There we go. Um, so we're going to, if, if you can hearken back uh, a bit to some of your high school or maybe early style, uh, your, your, your freshman level seminars in science, uh, we're going to talk about a couple um, basic concepts in ecology. Uh, the first one being trophism. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but, you know, everybody can picture, you know, energy comes from the sun. Plants grow, photosynthesis, other things eat that, the, the, that plant matter. Things eat those things that eat plant matter, uh, you know, and, and that we have an opportunity as humans to eat higher or lower on the trophic scale, depending on whether we like steaks or we're a vegan. Uh, you know, that there, to know that there's a huge difference in the amount of energy that it takes to keep that person alive, if they're eating nothing but steaks, or if they're eating nothing but say, you know, rice and or tofu or something along those lines, that, that there's a huge difference in the amount of energy that is required to keep that person alive. That's one of the concepts I kind of want you to sort of keep a little bit in the back of your head. Um, now this is, uh, let's see, was this? Yeah, this first uh, uh, diagram then, this was pulled from Wikimedia. Um, so primary producers. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm really gonna try to stay away from getting deep into the science, but just thinking, you know, your plants, algae, Deep sea thermal vents, uh, it's not sunlight, it's chemical energy, but it's still primary, what's called primary productivity or primary producer. Uh, secondary, us, uh, bacteria, fungi, archaea, uh, and if, if anybody remembers, those are the three kingdoms of microorganisms, um, bacteria, fungi, and archaea, um, and they get their energy from primary producers. And the thing to keep in mind that every time you go from one step to the other in, that, in those trophic systems, you only have about a 10% energy or mass transfer. So I'm only getting 10% out of the carrots that I'm eating, uh, say. Uh, and if I go, um, you know, if, if say I'm eating rabbits and the rabbits are eating the carrots, the amount of sunlight energy that gets to me then is only 1%. 
So it's, I think it's, it's, it's exponential. There's, there's only about 10% transfer. So just kind of keep that in the back of your head. Um, don't, I don't want to go into any deeper than that right now. Uh, but once again, these slides are going to, going to be available um, later on if you would like to review them or ask me some questions, whatever, we've, we've got time. Um, so what is a wetland? Uh, kind of getting into the, the, the meat and the potatoes of it here. Um, this, is, this is my definition. Uh, and it has been pretty practical across a whole lot of uh, uh, ways of evaluating things that you're looking at. It's like, well, is that a wetland? Is that a wetland? Is that a wetland? Like, you'd be surprised. This, this, this holds true for a lot of different situations or embodiments, people, animals, things we can, uh, but holds water constantly. You and I, we're full of blood and water. Okay, just keep that in mind. Um, or if you think about a, uh, you know, at, at, at the bottom of a valley, in an area uh, that is uh, very deep and is full of lots of sediment, that can be a wetland too, uh, but it's holding water constantly. That water and material flow through, so there's a flux of uh, material going through that, and, and it's important to remember that it's an open system. It isn't a closed system, that, they're, uh, that it's an open system. The whole planet Earth, it's an open system. We still have energy coming in from the sun. Um, Let's uh, so also a wetland captures and breaks down living matter, decomposition. Uh, you know this is all uh, pretty pretty normal. I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with these these concepts here, um, and also called natural cycling or natural attenuation. Uh, Pete and I had talked about natural attenuation a bit earlier today. Um, there is a lot of surface area to volume. Um, this picture right here uh, in, in the background. Uh, one of the most beautiful weddings I've ever been to. Uh, it was right down in South Carolina, uh, Charleston area, and you see surface area, and you see water, and you see border borderlands. Uh, unfortunately, you also see the uh, the loading and unloading docks out there in, in, in the background, but uh, you can't have everything. Um, and because of that surface area, perched upon that surface area is, are microbes. Uh, in general, we'll talk about bio, we're not going to talk much about biofilm today. Uh, that, that's kind of beyond the scope of this. Just to know that the biofilm is a thing, it exists. It covers every square inch of the planet. It's up to half of all the biomass on the planet, things that you can't even see. And that it is doing the primary, the, the bulk of the biogeochemical cycling AKA the decomposition breakdown and cycling. So, uh, so there, because of this surface area, upon which things can attach, as opposed to like free floating out in the, uh, out in the open waters, which is called pelagic. Not that you need to remember that, but that's, that's the name for that, that term. Um, because of all the surface area and things growing all over it, there's an enormous amount of biomass within these wetlands. And the biomass that grows is determined by what goes in. Uh, so it's, it's, I won't get too much into self-organization, but know that in an open system, microbes will thrive or be wiped out depending on, is there enough oxygen? Is there enough food? You know, these, these very basic eater, or eat or be eaten kind of uh, um, concepts that you, you would think of in, in nature, just in, as in general. Um, I'm going to go through some, now, through some things that by definition, could loosely be construed as a wetland, uh, but have direct impacts with us as potential seasteaders. You know, you're out in the water. That water is going to be saline for the most part. Uh, when we'll talk a little bit more about the constituents later, but just know that you know it's salt water. So kelp forests. What do you see there? Well, there's water. It's there constantly. A lot of biomass. A lot of surface area. In an open environment, that can self-organize. Now it's not constrained like in the middle of a valley or anything, but you would technically have all of those components right here. Now this is a kelp forest, um, bull kelp, uh, and this is uh, uh, formed off of Northern California. Uh, and this is coming from uh, uh, NOAA. So I try to cite everything on here if you would like to go back and take a look what, what the sources are. Um, and you see loads of fish and other critters and it's a whole forest and it's here determined by, you know, you've got sunlight coming in. So this is primary productivity. And then you got secondary uh, uh, and, uh, consumers in the fish. And so there's a lot of things that we as people can eat even right there. Uh, so these, these are the environments 
it's not very deep here either. You know, there it's there's a limitation on on how deep um, light will, depending on its its wavelength, will penetrate into the water column, which determines what you can grow. So mostly shallow water in bays and the like. Um, uh, tide pools are another potential example of wetlands. Uh, I took this picture, sorry it's a little washed out, but I was, it's, it's uh, just a gorgeous picture. Uh, this is when I was backpacking with my buddies Jeff and Forrest that you can see on the, uh, the left there. Uh, this is, <laughs> speaking of Oregon mountains, this is the, uh, the, oh actually this is the Washington coast. Um, but uh, you can see you've got surface area, you've got something holding water, water being held constantly uh, and all sorts of different critters in there in an open system that is allowed to self-organize. Uh, salt marshes, once again, surface area, lots of water. And you, you can kind of you can kind of see the pattern here. Uh, but these are all potential different places that we could get food from. And that is also responsible for uh, doing a lot of the water, the biogeochemical cycling, you know, the, the decomposition. Uh, of, of matter and uh, both capturing that material. And uh, you know, you've got primary productivity that allows for secondary productivity, uh, lots of biodiversity, you know, because uh, uh, humanity was not meant to live on bread and water alone. We need to be able to have a lot of different food sources or else we're gonna have all sorts of problems in this uh, with, with our diets or with our health. And, and, and I'm looking at this mostly if you are off in the middle of a gyre somewhere off in either the Atlantic or the Pacific, uh, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at here. This is, you're really more on your own, uh, little house on the prairie style, you kind of, water world, you kind of have to be able to take care of yourself because sure, there's, there, there's vessels and the like going forth, uh, going, going back and forth, but the idea is to be as sustainable uh, and permanent in your own culture as you possibly can so that if, uh, you know, something, uh, some major storm comes along uh, that you're capable of taking care of yourselves for the long term. Uh, mangroves. Uh, this is OneTreePlanted.org. Uh, I really had a good time doing the research for this presentation because I came across a lot of different organizations I didn't know existed. This was a new one for me too. Um, as you can see, we've got uh, surface area, water, lots of biodiversity, an open environment, primary and secondary productivity. Uh, and it's something that can grow quickly, carbon sequestration. Uh, you have inedible biomass being developed and built, but you can use that, you know, does it, I, I wanna make sure that everybody understands like the things that we grow, there's gonna be a, most of it we can't eat. Uh, if you, because you have to be able to accumulate uh, biomass through one form or another. Um, think of like how useful bamboo is. Well, you can make pipes or, or really, really good flooring out of it. There's a whole bunch of things that you can make from uh, uh, bamboo. Uh, well, I guess you can eat the shoots. So there is that. Uh, but as far as mangroves go, um, you've got this uh, more durable material that's going to be longer lasting. So you can do more things with it. Uh, and it's providing an enormous amount of, like I said, surface area. And in this case, habitat. Uh, and uh, I, I like the idea of mangroves so much. Um, wave attenuation is a big one. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but you've got uh, this coral reef directly under uh, the the mangroves, so you have these, you know, a whole bunch of different um, metabolic pathways, living things growing right on top of each other. Uh, increased biodiversity means there's more potential products that are available, healthier ecosystem long term. Uh, and if you're thinking healthy, healthy ecosystem, healthy farm. Uh, ultimately, if you're living out there, once again, this is, you know, permaculture. We're, we're really trying to set ourselves up to be able to use the resources and know the lay of the land and understand the characteristics of and the differences between salt water and fresh water. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, too. Uh, okay, I like, I liked Waterworld. No surprise, I started a business called Eco Islands. Uh, yeah, I mean, but there were certainly some things in it. The science was bad, but it was a fun movie. The Valdez, that was great. Um, I actually found that jar, the picture there uh, with, with credits then, of uh, the jar of soil that they were using. And, and, and as I grew older, I'm like, oh, there's still gonna be a bunch of salt in that jar or, and, and, and uh, mixed in among the, uh, the soil. And you know, whatever happened to aquaponics or hydroponics? You don't, you don't need salt. 
or excuse me, you don't, you, you don't need, actually need the soil. If anything, that's just kind of wasted mass. Um, now you may need some of the other materials that are in the soil, iron, manganese, um, boron or molybdenum, um, say that one five times fast. Uh, that, that, that there, it, it, I put it in there because it does also represent that you're not going to get everything you need out of salt water necessarily. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. But so for a farm, so this is kind of the meat and potatoes here. What, so you're out on a seastead. What are the things that a, uh, a wetland or a wetland bioreactor or an aquaculture or aquaponic system, what's it going to be able to do for you? Why bother going to the, the additional time and energy and expense of building these more diverse systems uh, within your personalized seastead. Um, so food, right off the bat. I mean, start thinking about your know, Maslow's needs, you know, you, you air, water, shelter, food, uh, you know, companionship, eventually self-actualization. I think I'm missing one in there, but you know, kind of, you know, what, what, what do we need to stay alive? And then what do we need to thrive and be the people that we want to be out on these seasteads? Um, but obviously food, um, vegetables and animals. Uh, you know, you'll you'll have your nets. Uh, you'll probably have both freshwater and saltwater aquaculture or aquaponic systems, likely. Um, and edible carbon sources, the mangroves, or uh, you know wh whatever else that you're growing that you can't eat directly, but will also support that uh, your your localized habitat and environment in and around your seastead, whether it be underneath or it's floating along with you. You know, you, you really have to think about the vertical column of your seastead as the total of your farm. It isn't just two dimensional flat Kansas farmland and, and, you know, and, and that's, that's the limit of your primary productivity. You, you got a lot more room to move in a three dimensional structure when thinking about seasteading. Um, so, uh, one big thing about the inedible carbon sources, uh, whether it be like mangroves or hemp uh, or, or bamboo, is that they become a carbon sink uh, and a nutrient sink as well. Uh, so as they're, they're pulling up their nutrients from the ocean uh, or, or from your freshwater aquaponic system that you are sequestering them for the time being. Uh, and you can then re-release at a later time, getting use out of it, but you haven't lost the materials, the inputs necessarily, as long as you do a proper breakdown of the material and you just don't throw it overboard uh, after the fact. You know, don't, when, if you spend all this time and energy into gathering this stuff, you just don't want to waste it. Um, so energy through biogas uh, is one of the potentials. Uh, some of our new reactors that are uh, designed to be sealed are also designed to be methane digesters. Uh, so that's something that we're going to be moving into here pretty soon as, you know, I mean, I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with uh, methane uh, digestion, uh, and we're, we're just finally getting into that now ourselves. Uh, but methane, then, depending if you have methane fuel cells, uh, I'll talk about that later. That's, that's a later slide. Um, but habitat and wave attenuation, uh, cooler waters, uh, uh, they, cooler water down to about 39 degrees Fahrenheit has um, greater oxygen saturation. Uh, so if you think that sometimes like, you know, rainbow trout in, in uh, mountain streams, when it gets warm, they don't do well because there's less oxygen. Uh, some of the most productive areas on the entire planet for primary uh, and secondary productivity are up in Alaska. Uh, you know, the, the crabbing fields, I'm sure everybody's watched uh, Deadliest Catch. Those areas where you've got good mixing, cooler water, lots of oxygen saturation are some of the most productive on the planet. Um, so cool, cooler water doesn't necessarily, it, it may not be great for us, but it's generally pretty good for everything else. Um, that, that's one of those reasons why when you're, you're down in the, uh, the Caribbean or, or Caribbean, I, I guess if you're hoity-toity, uh, is that you're looking through the water and it's very, very clear and blue because there's nothing living in it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy. Sure, it may feel like it's, it's fun to go swimming in, um, but cooler waters, uh, especially with, with climate change and um, uh, uh, coral bleaching uh, due to pH changes and, and uh, calcium and silica solubility issues uh, are some of the things that we, you know, as seasteaders have to be concerned about and actively thinking of as we're moving through our environments, whether we're anchored or whether we're constantly circulating in a gyre. You know, it doesn't matter if the, the bottom's 10,000 feet below you, uh, you know, it can still affect what's happening to you on the surface. Um, Let's see, oh, habitat. So you got places for critters to hide and thrive. 
that's your food source or something else's food source. Uh, you know, that, that's, it, it isn't just about uh, us and our direct needs. It's, you gotta, you gotta think about the bigger pictures. Like, you know, obviously we're not going around and eating the worms at the farm, but without the worms, everything else, the, the farm itself could very well collapse, or at the very least your, the, the uh, farm's productivity is going to drop way down. Um, so, you know, we, we need these other things just to keep us alive because well, once again, you know, no pun intended, but no, no person is an island here, even when we're on an island we're still connected to the rest of the environment. We still require it to keep us alive, especially if you don't want to talk to anybody else. If you want to be a, go out there and be a hermit, that's when you really have to be a pretty decent ecologist among all the other sailing things that you would have to know. It's uh, the, the amount of yeah, the people who really pull this stuff off, my, my, hat, my hat is off to them because the, the, the breadth of skill sets that you would need to survive out there long term is just it's it's daunting um energy uh so at least biologically at least related to a, a wetland uh through methane or methane uh purification with through sulfate removal we won't get too much into that one but um you want to get your sulfur out of your methane uh or else it can corrode uh different fixtures or tanks that you hold the methane in so it's not talking about that today, but that, that would be another topic later on. Uh, and of course, water treatment. Uh, and I look at this as there's um, three different kinds of water treatment. You've got gray water, uh, sewerage. I don't call it black water. Uh, black water would, is, you think of a black water tank. Well, that means that you're just waiting for somebody to pump it out. But we don't have that option. You can't just overboard it. Uh, so we, if, if we think of it as sewerage, as something that can be taken care of in a municipal treatment system, it, it, it's important to call it what it actually is because now we'll think about, well, I can't just, you know, what happens when my tank fills up and you're in a shallow bay with a bunch of other sea, sea pods next door. You, you're either going to have to pay for somebody to come in and pump it out uh, or you're going to have to treat that, uh, your, your black water, thus making it sewerage uh, and then passivating the, the, the different negative impacts. And I've got a slide later on for that. Um, gray water, uh, hand washing, um, uh, water fountains, those kind of things. Um, and either, you know, minorly impacted uh, and came from potable or your rainwater uh, cistern. And of course, partial desalination. Um, there's, a, there's a slide, I'll talk about that later, but food. Um, so freshwater foods. Um, Freshwater, there are a bunch of different ways that you could go ahead and pull in food sources while you're on the seastead. You got freshwater aquaponics, chickens and other fowl. Uh, I know it, it sounds kind of cliche, but you know, I I like some some dippy eggs in the morning. If I'm gonna be out there, uh, you know, they those chickens also become your pets and you don't have to eat them directly. So you're not sacrificing the means by which you are also getting protein um, and, and other uh, healthy foods fatty acids, different kinds of uh, vegetable uh, or proteins that you would, uh, and, and vitamins that you would need to keep yourself healthy uh, out on the open environment. Um, microgreens uh, is, is a potential fresh or salt water. I don't know of any salt water off the top of my head. That's, didn't get that deep into it. Um, tilapia potentially for fresh water, um, or if you had a salmon farm or something along those lines. Um, the, uh, all normal terrestrial vegetables, depending on what your temperature and your climate is. Uh, you know, you don't, don't expect to get a whole lot of, uh, uh, say, broccoli or something when you're uh, down on the, uh, the equator. Some things just don't do well. Uh, other things like yams are gonna go like, probably go like gangbusters. Um, onions, carrots, fruit trees, sure, why not? They're small, they provide uh, lots of vitamin C. So, you, you know, scurvy, uh, scurvy dogs, uh, you know, uh, and the, the gin and tonics and, and the like. That's the, historically that's where that term came from. Um, and then saline and aquapon uh, aquaponics and aquaculture, fish farms. Uh, I came across this uh, uh, pretty cool the uh, the Have Farm. They're calling it the what, the largest ship in the world. Uh, is it a ship? Sure, why not? I mean, I, I I don't really get a sense how big this thing is, but it's supposed to be like Evergrande style or ever, ever evergreen the, the there's that big uh, container ship that went and got itself stuck in the Suez Canal, that size. I get the impression that that's what they're talking about here. Uh, of course, there's a basic diagram on aquaponics where you have uh, fish mass. The fish are breathing out uh, ammonia. 
like we breathe out of carbon dioxide, they're they're releasing uh, NH4, uh, yeah, NH4 ammonia, uh, and then that, which is a primary uh, nutrient for plants, and then just keeping its own little closed loop, semi closed loop system, uh, and this would be uh, something that you can have on the uh, the vessel uh, on your seastead. Um, and it's also one of those things because remember, fresh water is less dense than salt water. So you can have big tanks of fresh water floating in the water directly and just kind of uh, lashed or, or something or yeah, you know, trailing behind you. Uh, so you, you don't necessarily always have to have all of your mass on the seastead itself. Uh, so just, you know, you can get kind of creative when you don't care about going more than one and a half knots or you're just cruising along with the current. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, another, there's another display there of uh, uh, fish farming. Uh, let's see, so inedible carbon sources, uh, which are, you know, things that you can compost. Obviously, any food waste, uh, you, not that you should be wasting any food when you're out there, but there, you know, you, you will have some uh, compostables and your secondary consumers. Um, practically speaking, on the sea stead, stead itself, you're going to have something like an incinerator or some kind of a grinder. Um, that can increase the surface area of that material, add water to it, and that's what goes into your uh, your composting reactors. Um, let's see, food scraps, like I mentioned, animal processing waste, uh, guts, blood, awful, eggshells. Uh, I didn't want to get too visceral on this because I was like, yeah, yeah, we don't need to see that. Um, but, it, you know, when it comes down to it, yeah, this is, you're going to have to do your own processing. Get used to it. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, just, uh, just it's the nature of the beast. Um, you got excess uh, kelp and seaweed that you may be pulling up with your catch. Um, uh, you know, people in Japan have been surviving on kelp and seaweed, and not just Japan, you know, uh, throughout the world, uh, close to shores for thousands of years. Uh, this is, you know, we're, we're, you know, here in America, we don't think about eating that a whole heck of a lot. But it's this is really useful and nutrient energy dense food sources that you're just pulling straight up out of the water. Um, obviously, leftover organic garden matter, uh, the stalks, roots, leaves, um, say for hemp, uh, which is producing an enormous amount of uh, woody uh, material, woody herbaceous, uh, lignin based uh, materials that you yourself can't eat but you could use this process down uh, either for making rope uh, as one possibility um, for, for your lines and the like. Um, you know, just thinking about the things that you can build with what you have uh, on hand. Uh, for, for Martian habitats, it's called ISRU or in situ resource utilization. Um, you kind of have to have that mindset like, all right, I don't have a whole lot to work with here. So I got to make sure I hoard and hold on to everything I've got. What else can we grow? What else can we do uh, to, to, get have our needs taken care of um let's see uh and then some of these other woody products so basically all your waste good amount of it uh can be rendered down to methane uh which we talked a little bit about earlier and then as you drive off methane um as a gas from your reactors you're left over with a leachate of a, a nutrient dense solution which is fertilizer uh nitrogen potassium uh, uh phosphorus Sulfur, calcium, mag uh, magnesium, iron, uh, manganese are the biggies right there. Um, and those are, those are the major nutrients and micronutrients for terrestrial environments. Um, for saline environments, there's a lot of potassium already in the salt water. So that's actually one you don't have to worry about. Uh, shelter and wave attenuation. Here's another, I love this picture. The sea pods. I, I, boy, I really hope we can land that gig uh, and, and make sure that we get to build the, uh, the recycling system for inside the sea pods here. Uh, but each one of those spars, uh, which is also where their buoyancy is coming from, and this is a very, very stable system. Uh, they do this thing called the wine test where they'll go all the way up on top and just put a wine glass and, and you don't see it moving and the waves are going by pretty, uh, pretty aggressively and there's no movement at the wine glass level because this particular uh, structure, uh, along with the flip ships, uh, are very stable. And so you, they, they have an opportunity where on these, uh, the spars and the, the buoyancy systems of putting on a bunch of solar panels, uh, or you could have a, uh, one section of it um, dropping down below nets of some kind. 
so there, there's a lot that you can do with uh, um, the seed pods uh, as they're as they're coming up. And as mentioned before, they seem to be about the farthest ahead. And certainly, uh, they've got a lot of practical experience. And now they're making a look awesome on top of it. So that's it's uh, it's, it's an interesting time. Um, wave attenuation. Here you've got mangroves. So say you had a, another ring outside of your um, of the the sea stead, and you had mangroves growing all the way around that. Now the waves getting to the intersections. You've almost got your own little sheltered bay that you could then swim in or do whatever you want to do. Uh, in, but it, it allows you for more protection and reduces some of the 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 long term. Um, how, how would you put it? The, the stresses on the steel structure of the spars. So if, if you can attenuate some of the waves that are coming in and, and make it so there's less stress on the system at large, the whole sea pod will last longer. Um, yeah, this, sorry, this isn't a very sexy slide. Um, energy sources, the only one that, uh, that I really want you to focus on is the methane digester to biogas, because that's the one that directly relates to uh, wetland technologies. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can get energy out there, like uh, propane, biogas in a tank, solar, wind, wave. Uh, you guys have heard of that stuff before. Not going to uh, cover that too heavily right now. But the uh, big thing was the uh, capturing and cycling and breakdown of nutrients uh, and the methane itself as an, a potential energy source. Um, so talking a little bit about salt water itself. Um, and its differences from fresh water. Uh, so obviously we've got sea salts there, we've got sodium uh, and chloride, uh, um, Na sodium and Cl for chloride, or chlor uh, chlorine chloride. Um, those, are the, those are the biggies the, the, and they are, it's very difficult to do desalination for water. Um, it, the technology exists, it's not, that's not an issue, it's the the energy that you have to put in to pressurizing these reverse osmosis systems and then the filtration uh, media, the, um, some of, sometimes they use this stuff called naphthium, uh, is expensive and difficult to get your hands on, uh, especially when you're out in the middle of nowhere. And can you properly reconstitute it? How long will these filters, these RO filters last? Those are all different issues that are, you know, it's, boy, in a pinch, it's perfect. It works great, but it's not practical for the long term to get all of your water from um, reverse osmosis, uh, potable water that is, uh, from reverse osmosis. You're definitely going to be wanting to look at rainwater capture um, as one of your primary means of having enough potable water for you know yourself plus all the rest of your systems, your own personal comfort uh, and the like. Um, so uh, let's see, yeah, chloride, uh, sulfate, calcium, potassium, magnesium, and your other minor constituents. Um, those, those can technically be driven off through what's called sulfate reduction. There's another slide, we'll talk about that in a second, but just so long as you know that it's very difficult to get the sodium and the chloride out of the water. And there's only a couple technologies that'll do that effectively. They're expensive and they're energy, uh, uh, use a lot of energy. Um, that other salinity levels there right next to it, fresh water kind of gives you an idea. Um, you can, you can, I like to use what's called electroconductivity, EC. That's how I measure uh, the, the, at least in mine drainage, that's, that's the, the metric that we like to use. And it's a very inexpensive little uh, probe that you can use, you know, 20 bucks, $30 off of Amazon for even a decent one. Um, and it's something that you have to think about the monitoring and the constant, um, not near constant, but, you know, just keeping an eye on what are the conditions of the water, the different water components and sources within your individual seastead. If you have fresh water, you want to keep the salt out. We'll talk about that in a second. But fresh water, brackish water, saline, that's the ocean, and then brine water. Um, think like um, the, the Red Sea. Mono Lake in, a, um, in, in California, which is a terminal lake because it only loses water through evaporation, the Great Salt Lake. Uh, those are all instances of, uh, of super, super uh, briny water in this case. Uh, let's see. So, oh, okay, moving right along. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, oh, yeah, we're doing pretty good. Uh, just a couple more here. So I'm not going to get too deep, deep into the water treatment, but um, 
Step number one, the most important thing about your fresh water is keeping the salt water out of your fresh water. Um, like that, that's number one, because as, as already mentioned, it is really hard to get chloride uh, or chlor uh, chlorine chloride uh, or sodium out of your water once it's already in. It's because it's, it's called, uh, the term is hygroscopic or it's a miscible salt. Um, where the easiest, really, I mean, you got reverse osmosis, there's remo removed only through RO condensation, um, which is, that's, that's legit, especially where it's really sunny and warm. But what if you, you know, decide that you're going to go ahead and take your seastead, uh, you know, up farther north? Uh, you know, you, you're, you're, if, if something's directly predicated on your amount of thermal energy, condensation is or is not maybe a good, good uh, alternative. Um, biological desalination through sulfate reduction, which I'd mentioned, um, which can drive off calcium, magnesium, iron, and uh, manganese and other metals. Uh, and you could do um, potassium K, potassium removal through photosynthesis. But that's only 14% of your EC. So if you're thinking about everything that's making up your electroconductivity in that water, the big bulk of it is still sodium chloride, which is still hard to really drive off. So this is why, you know, got to hammer this one. If you've got clean, fresh water, you got to do everything you can uh, just through, um, uh, you know, practice. Good, the standard, op we call it SOP in the, in the service, standard operating procedures. What are you doing to make sure that you're keeping the water as clean as possible so you don't have to go to these really intensive other energy-based uh, systems? Um, yeah, uh, so some of the things you can do is rinsing yourself off when you go for a swim with your outside shower. Uh, using rainwater. Uh, don't use potable water that you can drink. Rainwater, well, you can drink rainwater, but you know, you, you want to hit it with UV first or ultraviolet light that can, you're essentially nuking any critters that are in there um, so that they can't reproduce. Uh, and and that it, it doesn't effectively kill them immediately. They just can't reproduce. Um, Dad was a microbiologist and he's, for his, um, for his master's, he said that he uh, he was doing UV studies and he's like, ah, I must have nuked trillions of those little suckers was uh, was the line that he told me. I thought that was kind of that was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, rinsing yourself off uh, your catch and harvest with uh, uh, rainwater, uh, washing all of that. So any fish that you're pulling up, any kelp make, you know, rainwater comes comes from the heavens. Go ahead and use it. Because as long as you can get as much of that salt out of there and, and really just make sure that it's as clean as possible, what's going inside uh, is as, uh, there's as much salt removed. That's the easiest way to make sure that you're not going to have any issues. Um, and also uh, pre-wash all salt spray expo uh, exposed on your cistern collection surfaces. So if um, you know, you're, you're at the top of your seed pod and they do have uh, a cistern collection system. But if you've got all that salt spray going onto your sea pod, and then, then all of that is technically going into your cistern as well. Uh, so that's, that's a case where you may want something along the lines of a, um, a little solenoid hooked up to an EC monitor. That as the rain comes down, you get your first flush, washes all the salt off, and then you collect your rainwater. Uh, so that's, uh, and that's a very simple little electrical probe and uh, solenoid monitoring system. Uh, that will once again help keep your water, your fresh water, fresh. Uh, let's see, um, gray water, potable gray water to gray water reuse and purification. Uh, once again, keep it as clean as you possibly can uh, for as long as you possibly can. Get as many reuses as, out of it as you possibly can. Um, let's see, easier to purify back to potable, um, low electroconductivity, once again, low EC, that's, that's the rainwater. Um, and uh, rainwater's natural pH is about a 6.7. So, uh, you know, and it, it will pick up dust and the like coming down through the atmosphere. And then even on your collection surface, uh, it's likely to pick up microbes. Um, the, the, why you don't use roof water uh, here on, on, you know, in the States or on, on, you know, the continents is because of salmonella from bird poo. And, and to treat for that, then you were going to want to look at, once again, UV and filtration to make sure that you're wiping out those microbes. Otherwise, it's perfectly good water. Um, gray water is hand washing, showering, dishwashing, laundry, uh, kitchen sink. As soap and dirt are things that you're going to have to uh, consider. Um, and you obviously don't want uh, no bathing suits in your uh, in your fresh wash water. 
go ahead and take them outside. And, you know, even if you had just a little washing, uh, you know, old school, like a washing um, basin with, you know, one of those, uh, the, one of the washboards, don't let that water that's on your, your clothes, uh, that salt into inside. Uh, so just SOP, standard procedures, like this is, you know, you just have to just think about where you are and what, what, what are the conditions, in which case that's cheap. You know, just just gotta you know you're playing the game. Uh, it's, it was um, back in basic training, Fort Benning, back in '97. That was our uh, battalion motto: is just play the game. You know, you're just gonna have to make some some pretty minor adjustments, and then you get so much more clean water. Uh, and just keeping that in mind, and you know, kind of preaching the gospel, so to speak, keep your fresh water fresh. Um, another non-sexy slide, uh, but municipal sewerage cycling and solutions. So. The systems that we're looking at right now would be then using the your your gray water to fill up the toilets. Essentially, that's what you're looking at. Um, so some of the issues that you're looking at then uh, human waste is very low in carbon because we've exhaled most of it already. That that's that's how we're uh, releasing most of our, our carbon. And you're thinking about that 10% rule that comes back into, you know, as we, we re-release this carbon dioxide, which of course plants love, uh, but, you know, has its own negative impacts long-term. Um, so uh, a lot of nutrients, toilet paper is a really good carbon source uh, for your reactors. Um, and you want to, you, this is where you really want your reactors to have a good shot at breaking materials down, but natural wetlands are very good at degrading pathogens fecal coliforms, E. coli. Um, nematodes can eat up to 600 fecal coliform in an hour. And that's one of the ones that really can get us sick. So wetlands will, in some cases, do the vast majority of your pathogen degradation because pathogens got this big warm body and then you're gonna have, and they're, they're thriving, they're living well in us. And then you're gonna put them into this, you know, frigid, cold, little, you know, saline or, uh, uh, or you know, another environment where all the physical characteristics are radically different from where they thrive inside of us. And then it's very easy to predate upon them. Um, prions, I was talking to Dr. Dan about this one. Another reason why, unless you are really hard up, you def, like you don't, you don't wanna be reusing your black water system for anything other than like, you know, uh, recapturing nutrients, essentially. Um, prions like mad cow disease. Now this is in a closed loop system where they're constantly recycling over and over and over and over and over again. The system as designed as, and that, 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 that I advocate is pretty much just a one pass through system, but you, uh, from, from rainwater and potable through your gray water to your black water, and then even absorbing those nutrients uh, within different plants, whether it be inedible plant mass, that way you don't have to re worry about reintroducing it into us. Um, but that is just, just throwing that out there, that that's a thing. You know, the, these, these are the large, larger considerations. Um, pharmaceuticals, you know, my blood pressure medications. I couldn't tell you whether they're broken down in a wetland or not. I'm not a doctor. Uh, we have done studies with Penn State using mine drainage uh, materials that show uh, in hospital sewerage, which has a higher uh, amount of pharmaceuticals, that uh, something like of the 50% of the pharmaceuticals that were broken down, they were broken down like by 99% within 24 hours. Didn't touch the other 50% though. So it's, it's not a panacea. It doesn't work necessarily for everything. Um, and uh, heavy metals then, uh, they're, you know, Generally, if you've got heavy metals in your body and they're hyperaccumulating, uh, you're you're in some trouble. That's that's not good. Uh, but if if you are uh, um, excreting, passing these heavy metals, then they can be captured through what are called reducing wetlands um, instead of uh, like uh, methane digesters. That's a, that's an example of a reducing wetland. Um, you could also do microfiltration, RO, uh, or electrolysis. So it's, it's not, we're, we're not making the claim of a oh, wetland will do everything for you. No, it will not, but it can do 90% of everything for you. And then you rely on other technologies. Um, but uh, I heard this thing about gaskets on a vessel. Two is one and one is none. And you, you always want redundancy and backup uh, in, in all things, all of your systems, because boy, I'll tell you what, help may not be anywhere around the, you know, for quite some time. Um, one thing with uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, heavy metals, and the th these things that are in human waste is that a healthier lifestyle will directly impact 
the health of your uh, of the wetlands, primary and secondary producers upon which you rely. You know, um, food in, food out, and if you can maintain a pretty healthy lifestyle as much as possible, that will also determine what's going into your waste reactors, which then will determine as they're broken down what the byproducts could potentially be for other portions of your habitat, uh, you know, of, of your ocean bound ecosystem, essentially. Uh, okay, in summation. Uh, yeah, so wetlands, there, there it is. Wetlands will do about 90% of the cycling for a seasteader farm, and but you still want to do other technologies for the last 10%. Redundancy. Don't rely on one thing overly. Uh, you, you want to be able to use multiple things, especially when RO is so well understood and it, it, it is so reliable. Once again, just energy intensive. Um, let's see, the uh, wetland cycling reduces energy consumption one to two exponents. Uh, and that's, that I, I'm pulling those numbers in from when we do mine drainage treatment systems based off of our reactors, because once again, we, we do acid mine drainage remediation. Um, our reactors are one to two exponents more efficient in the removal of pollutants, generally iron, aluminum, and manganese over other constructed wetlands of the same size. So that's that's where we're, we're coming with those numbers. Uh, I, I generally... I measure the productivity of our, our reactors in grams removed per cubic meter of volume a day. That's the metric I like. Uh, that, that, that seems to be, because uh, that's something that you can then get a good apples to apples with other treatment systems, whether it be constructed wetlands or a municipal treatment facility. And then go ahead and throw in dollars there too. But you know that that is another metric. But we're not talking about that right now. Although they are significantly cheaper because you know the the microbes are working for peanuts. They're just doing their thing. They're self uh, self inoculating. They came from the open environment uh, and they are capable of adaptation uh, as seasons change, conditions change, influent concentrations change. A wetland can adapt. Other systems, not necessarily. Uh, one, one downside of a, a reverse osmosis is brine water. After you've pulled it all out, yeah, you get clean water, but now you've got this really hyper-concentrated brine. What are you going to do with that? Um, I mean, you could do electrolysis and do a chloralkali process, and then you've got sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, but most people don't want to have to mess with that. I'm just saying, there's other things you can, there's things that can be done and used it for, uh, used for it, like um, sodium hydroxide is a great pH balance and amendment. Um, you know, uh, hydrochloric acid is great for cleaning things, you know, so the solvents and the like, there's, there's, it is useful. You just don't need a lot, nowhere near as much as you would have if you're relying on RO for all of your water, uh, potable water needs. Um, limiting nutrients must be carefully hoarded. Uh, water should be used as many times as possible. And once again, hitting this one, it's a mantra, keep fresh water fresh. Uh, that, that was pretty much everything. This is, uh, actually my band, my, yes, I play in a nineties cover band cause I'm that age now and we have a lot of fun. So I just wanted to throw that one out. Captain nineties on Facebook, check us out. Uh, and, uh, Matt, I get, I'll go ahead and close this, uh, down here. Uh, Matt, let's do some Q and A. I'll coordinate the Q and A. Um, I have some questions that came up in the chat during the presentation and, um, but I think maybe parts of your, these questions have been answered already. Also, if anyone would like to unmute to ask, well, we can switch back and forth between the questions from the chat or, and, and then just having a discussion. So to just to start us off, Katie posted a question. How would you harvest from a salt marsh without hurting, destroying the ecosystem? and how many could a salt marsh feed? So I think Katie was referring to one of the salt marsh that you showed at the beginning as an example mm -hmm. of a wetland. Uh, good, great, great question. Um, technically thinking about seasteading, unless you're near a salt marsh uh, itself, which is uh, brackish water, uh, and generally at the points where uh, rivers are, are dumping into the ocean, so make going in the transition from that fresh water to the saline water. Um, it, 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 that's, that's a real good question. Uh, I, I don't think I've got a good answer for you. Um, the, the harvesting that you'd be looking at, I think of mostly as vegetable or as animal matter, uh, fish, crustaceans, um, 
limpets and other other things that you could uh, potentially eat as as kind of like a hunter gatherer sort of situation uh, because you're absolutely right over predation you're going to destroy your your the the environment that you are building so if you're thinking as a person on being vegan out on your seastead you know that you would need to maintain at least you know 10 to 100 times the biomass going back to trophism of uh, uh, of that biomass in order to keep you alive, knowing that you're going to have a 90% loss in energy of the food that you're eating and kicking over, uh, or, or and, and passing on through. Um, now, of course, in a salt marsh or or some of those other wetland technologies, you're also excreting a lot of the, the nutrients that those very things would need to survive. Uh, so there there is, uh, you know, you I there's a symbiosis between those two different points. Uh, I, I, I hope that answers your question because you're absolutely correct. You know, you know, you, you can't go out there and start destroying the very environment that you're, that you need to survive. Uh, and and it, you, generally that means you have to have a lot more of that environment and you have to be very careful about what your harvest rates would be. Uh, that, I, I think that's how I would approach that. Is, 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 is that, is that? Yes. Thank you for your answer. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, Albert has his hand raised. So Albert, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure. Uh, thanks for speaking. Um, so a lot of what you spoke about referred to uh, leveraging the, the benefits of wetlands and the possibility of uh, using the natural organisms, organisms to reduce the pathogen level in, in your waste streams. So mm -hmm. is that the kind of scenario where you would bring your, your waste to the wetlands and kind of deposit it? Uh, as an alternative to uh, land-based water treatment facilities? Uh, great, great question. And uh, so, um, let's see, I guess I missed, there's one last, uh, here, uh, here, I'm going to share this again real quick. I realized I skipped my very last slide. Uh, so I build bioreactors uh, for mine drainage. Uh, and these are essentially, can, can everybody see that? Um, the pictures of there's the black box there and a couple white boxes. Mm -hmm. Everybody see that? Yep. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Matt. Um, so these are self-organizing wetland bioreactors, and I build these and fill them up with shredded up coconut husks. So a we're actually building the wetland, and then you would have a much smaller reactor, like the, the black one there. That's about um, 500 gallons in volume. That is way bigger than you need. That would be good for like 10, 15, 20 something people as far as waste treatment uh, goes. Um, so you're not taking it anywhere. You would have the wetlands and, and uh, these bioreactors specifically for wastewater, uh, sewerage, human waste, uh, to be treated that way in an aerobic reactor. So you would have water recirculating within that system. Um, we have means we have uh, a bubbler system as well that can that, that'll bubble up from beneath if it's necessary, and that way you're keeping the 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 biomass. Uh, you're, you're you're doing what's called CBOD satisfaction or carbon and biological chemical and uh, biological oxygen demand satisfaction. So you're taking everything that's in there that is um, carbon based and turning it in pretty much into CO2 and water, which is one way of passivating um, or uh, predation of nematodes and other microbes that would eat those fecal coliforms uh, that are now no longer able to thrive because they're not inside your body. So you're, you're essentially building what is um, an extended gut outside of your body uh, that is continuing the breakdown process, uh, but still allowing for opportunities to capture those nutrients so that they aren't lost to the open environment because your nitrogen uh, potassium or yeah, phosphorus um, and your metals that are in your body are limiting micronutrients in a saline environment because they are at such tiny concentrations in seawater. Now on, on land, those are very available. Uh, you think about like most mine drainage is iron and manganese or aluminum. And we've got loads of nitrogen in our waters from our farming. It's all getting flushed out into the uh, into the open oceans. So you kind of have a, a depending on whether you're doing freshwater or saline, you have a switch. Um, but yeah, uh, getting back to it. So by inter introducing bioreactors that are functionally doing all the same things as wetlands, uh, you would be able to take your your natural wetlands with you and wetlands that you can control, monitor, and harvest materials off of. That's, that's fabulous. So it basically sounds like it's a, it's a modular system 
that could accompany any any seastead uh, for, uh, I guess, abatement purposes. Y yes. Yeah, yeah. Because it's uh, self-organizing, and it's like a field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. What you put into it will determine directly uh, through self-selection self and self-organization what the biofilm is. So if, if everybody all of a sudden, you know, say some, something happens and everybody gets sick, uh, you will, and, and you know, this is passing through us, obviously, because we're, we're excreting some of the things that are making us sick. In the wetland, then you will see a, a response of more critters, either through diversity or count in the biomass within, with, with, in the biota within that biofilm in response to the, the new influence. So what you put into it will determine what is gonna grow. And that's what we see in our mine drainage systems as well, uh, in particular with uh, manganese oxidation. Although I won't, I won't get too much into that right now, but it's, uh, if you think self-organization in an open environment that's allowed to self-select, um, that, that, that gives you essentially all of the remediation pathways that nature has already provided to us in, in a unit that is manageable and that is easy to quantify and understand and the plastic floats. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's not dragging you down either. So there's other benefits just through the physical structure of that reactor as well. Uh, if you wanted to build off of it or, or something along those lines. That's what I get to do for work. <laughs> I kind of like my job. So um, we've reached the end of our originally scheduled time, but Colin, if you're able to stick around and, and answer some more questions, um, sure, we can continue sure, for yeah. a bit, what do you think? Oh yeah, keep keep them coming. You got you got me. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm here. Okay, so from Sandy, she asked, "Do you envision freshwater habitats to be easier than salt or brackish, since it is at least a freshwater source?" Then, then a, a sorry, Sandy, I'm not quite understanding. Then a CISA community that must use catch or desalinization. I'm not quite sure of that second part of it. So. Oh, well, I, I think I think what I understand what she's getting at. Um, it, well, it's certainly easier to keep that pot of the, the fresh water for emergency needs back to something that you can drink. Um, the productivity, whether it be fresh water or saline water, if it's primary productivity, you're thinking photosynthesis, algae, uh, plant growth uh, are, I would think, going to be about the same. So I think energetically or what your yields would be are likely to be close. And uh, actually another really good friend of mine and one of the people on our team, Steli, uh, J. Ford the fourth is on here. Um, Steli, are you, 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 you want to take that one? What, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, Steli's a genius. Uh, that's why I work with him. Uh, he, he might have some thoughts. Not sure if he's available right now. I saw him on there. Uh, he, he, anyway, um, but uh, yeah, Sandy, I, I, I would expect that the productivity for either is going to be um, okay. Uh, just that the um, the fresh water would be more usable. Uh, long, hey there. Long so this is still. Oh, still, yeah. What's up, bud? What do you think? Hey there. So sorry about the background noise, guys. But on the question of whether fresh water versus salt water aquaponics, hydroponics would be more productive at the end point. That's actually something that's not really too, you know, governed by the greater, greater structure of salt versus fresh water because it's going to guide a lot of what you can actually grow in either of those hydroponic or aquaponic systems. So a lot of like what is going to contribute to yield is going to be about the available nutrients in the solution, regardless of whether there's salt or salt present or not. So you'd have to look at the individual species of plants that you're looking to grow to see their yields in particular. That's not something we've gone through and compared, but you can look at certain fast growing crops like kelp that can indicate that you could have pretty high growth rates in a salt water system, but comparing net yields is just not really feasible until we've got more physical systems using both. I concur. Limiting nutrients, uh, you know, it, it are there limiting nutrients uh, and are you able to decouple from those limiting nutrients within that particular ecosystem uh, or, or pathways is what you're going to be watching out for. That's why hoarding and or being able to separate your nutrients through wetland decomposition and then be able to reuse it, uh, it, it 
can have a really significant increase in the productivity of, of one of these other systems uh, because you, the thing that's holding it back, you know, is, is now no longer in the way and it can go ahead and go to whatever its max potential is depending on whatever the next limiting nutrient is or the amount of energy going into that particular system. So, you know, do you still have enough sunlight? And, you know, that's why um, in, in some lentic and lotic freshwater systems, the removal of phosphorus, doesn't matter how much nitrogen you have in the water, because if you can get just a that tiny last little bit of phosphorus out of your system, that, 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 that would then stop, say, like a golden algae bloom or, or uh, uh, cyanobacteria uh, blooms that would be negative, that would negatively impact, but it's easier to go after one particular nutrient than it is to just like clean all the cyanobacteria after it's already bloomed. Um, so that, that, that's a valuable pathway. And then in response to Sandy, doing the reverse thereof, making sure that you've provided all of the, uh, the, the micro and macronutrients in that system is the easiest way to get the best productivity. So it's, it is little apples to oranges, but those are all very noble, uh, noble things that can then be measured with pretty simple uh, wet tests, you would say, on your seastead. So just basic farming stuff. Once again, it's just, you know, do you, you have enough phosphorus and potassium for your soy to come up properly? Enough nitrogen for your corn? Those, those kind of questions. So it is, so, but that's a great question though, Sandy, thank you. So we had a couple questions from Chris and Chris, I think you can speak at a much higher level than I would be able to translate for you. So um, if you're able to unmute yourself, is there anything in particular that um, you wanna address? Cause you did, you did have a few comments in the chat. Uh, yeah, the, I would just like to see more practical applications. Um, you know, they showed us a couple black boxes and, a, and white boxes, but um, yeah, and um, and I'm surprised that that our uh, state of the art reports from a few years back are apparently lost in space somewhere. Uh, it would be good to, for those to resurface. We'll we'll track um, those down. Great, yeah. yes, please. Because we uh, we went into a lot of detail on those. Um, uh, one one quick question that I, I've been looking for and haven't found the response. Um, can, can you do uh, methane production in salt water? I would say, personally, I've never done it, but uh, the, the oceans have 40% more biodiversity. Uh, and the, the, of course, you know, if, if life had come from the oceans, the, the, the chances of methane production from CO2, through CO2 reduction in the oceans, I would assume, yes. Um, and, and that is something I would like to research, but I've, I've, I haven't seen any papers. I would assume yes. Uh, and that's a great question. Uh, and that would be something I would like to look into. Uh, thank you also for mentioning the Blue Frontier State of the Art uh, reports. I would definitely like to see those. I probably would have liked to have seen them before I did some of this, because mm -hmm. maybe I just rehashed a bunch of what you've already talked about. Um, and, and, and uh, yes, with the boxes, uh, pretty much I didn't want to make this all about my business. So I didn't want to get too much into mine drainage other than we build reactors. Uh, and if, if you would like, I'm, I'm happy to share some more information. Uh, if you go onto YouTube, um, especially if you go onto YouTube, geez, okay, uh, and you look up biomining products, there are loads of uh, systems um, from whether they be low pH iron oxidation um, or manganese oxidation. Those are the two that I work in the most right now. Um, especially the, the nice, th the interesting thing about um, low pH iron oxidation is rare earth element capture potential. Uh, so that's one of the um, lines of research that we're working on right now um, with uh, Penn State and West Virginia universities. Um, but yes, in, in response, I just wanted to stay on seasteads and wetlands and didn't want to make it all about, you know, rest of my business stuff. So that's why I kept it very light on that. But um, on YouTube, uh, Biomining Products are on my own webpage, Eco Islands LLC, loads of stuff. Uh, I've got so much video. Uh, it's, it's editing. But, but thank you, Chris, for your, uh, for, for your question. And I'd love to talk to you uh, more about the other uh, reactors at uh, you know, another time. We're already we're a little over. But I, uh, my email then is uh, available. I'd love to, love to talk more with you about it. Cool. Great. Yeah, awesome. Um, Thanks, dude. And yeah. you know, 
And so I just so, wanted to comment very quickly on the um, salt tolerant methanogens or methane generating bacteria in a salt please. environment. And so there is evidence, as far as I've seen quickly here, there is published evidence of salt tolerance genes in methanogens, which means that it does exist likely somewhere out there. Um, but like Colin said about there being methanogens at the bottom of the ocean, that's really one of the key things to look if you're looking for any sort of processing in these boxes, you know, because these boxes are mimicking a natural environment. So if there are salt tolerant, tolerant methanogens in the bottom of the ocean, then those would be the ones that you're seeking to get to populate the box. But the key factor here is that you must recreate the environment that they can tolerate. So you would have to make sure that there is one of those methanogen species that exists at a temperature that would be conducive to using these boxes because the bottom of the ocean is very cold. So that's just one thing to note there. Stelly, methane hydrate, hydrates, is that, is that abiotic or is that biotic? I'm not entirely sure on that one because there is a fair amount of um, dissolved carbon and methane in the ocean. So it could be precipitating out, but I know that there are endogenous methanogens in some areas. And I've found some papers that say that there are salt tolerance genes for hypersaline environments too. Yeah, it's probably a situation just where the methane is, because you've got this, this biofilm environment even, even deep into the water and in the pelagic zone, that the methane itself is just being consumed so radically, uh, so, excuse me, rapidly, as soon as you get any O2, um, any oxygen loving, uh, cr critter, um, it, that they're probably just using the methane directly as a fuel source because you've got those four hydrogen ions um, or a, a hydrogen atoms tacked onto that carbon atom, um, which is a, obviously a very energy dense. So it's it's probably pretty likely that as soon as you know the methane is being produced, it's being immediately used by another critter within the biofilm, and so that we don't see any. That, that's why you don't see any concentration buildups of it uh, in, in, in that water environment, because it's probably just getting used because it's great for an energy source. That's why it burns in, in oxygen. Um, so that, that's probably why we don't see it. But um, I would, that, that would, that is a very worthy experiment to run. I would like to see that. Uh, and, you know, it would, you would think it would work in the same way as the redox ladder does of, you know, knock all the rest of the electron acceptors out of the way first until you're down to CO2 and then just wait until, you know, keep introducing material and then just wait until you start seeing some methane come out or at least sulfate reduction, because at least then you know that your redox ladder is working. Uh, that's a little deeper in the science than I was willing, was intending to go, but that, that, that is a very testable hypothesis then. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or comments they want to chat with Colin about? Just going down through the, uh, the questions. If you think of something, what while you're looking, I'll, I'll just let you know, I put a couple of links in the chat. The first one is a feedback form. So you can let us know what you thought of the presentation. Um, if you've attended previous uh, seasteading socials, you can also share information about those, what you thought of that, and let us know what topics you'd like to hear about at a future event. Um, if you have a project that you would like to present at a future event, you can share that in the feedback form as well. And we'll get back to you. Um, and then also our next social will be April 21st. And the presenters will be from Sea uh, Cities in Florida. They have done some great research on how to develop amphibious uh, platforms. And we'll talk about a design called the Sea Manta. And so there's a link to our um, information page on that where you can also RSVP for that event. For April 21st. So thank you all for joining. Um, and are there any last comments or questions? Uh, I just wanted to throw out here real quick. Oh, uh, Pete. Uh, yeah, Pete, go ahead, man. You, it looks like you're going to ask one. Go for it. Uh, no, I just wanted to thank you for coming and doing this. Um, appreciate the, the way you presented and uh, just put it out there. And oh, yeah, I appreciate it, man. Sure. No, thank you. And, and we'll definitely be in touch. Uh, and then, uh, Chris, thank you. Uh, you had mentioned here, just go, I'm, I'm having a chance to go through some things. Lisa, thank you very much for the methanogenic article. Um, Chris, I don't know if you saw that one. Um, uh, Lisa had posted that. Let's see. Uh, uh, oh, okay, good. You got it. Uh, and then, uh, yes, as far as the bidets. So talking to ocean um, builders, uh, they have different options as far as bidets or urinals uh, to remove um, their 
their, their system is something that we wanted to address and we think we've got some opportunities to make their system uh, more efficient. Won't get too much more into that right now just because it, it is kind of a business thing for the moment. Um, uh, but as far as uh, removing urine from the system, that is one potential. Uh, of course, you want to try to recapture potentially, if we can, um, the nitrogen in the urine, uh, the urea, uh, and then the two ammonia. Um, that is something that we have not yet done, but is theoretically a possibility. Uh, uh, so we wouldn't lose that, um, that nitrogen um, uh, through uh, ammonia and then ammonia gas potentially, but that's not something we've done, but that is uh, on the, the, the testing schedule. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Re, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you again, Lisa, there for the uh, reuse of sewage water. Um, look into more. Look more into that. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Uh, fungi absorbing heavy metal in. Uh, plans question mark. Um, uh, yeah, we, we'd addressed heavy metals just briefly uh, through reduction uh, as, as one potential pathway. Uh, now that's not likely to be fungi because uh, fungi are, um, they are chemoheterotrophs like you and I are, so they breathe oxygen as well. Uh, and those, so the environments where you would get heavy metal now, I'm not saying they can't do it, but just from the experience and from what I, I, I'm reading and the way we would approach it uh, would be uh, through reduction, uh, essentially sulfate reduction. So you would be forming like metal sulfides, like lead sulfide, uh, other, other, other materials, uh, as opposed to oxides. You'd have, with oxygen, you'd have sulfides in those reduced environments. So that's, that might be one pathway uh, to treating it with... Um, wetlands. And of course, if that doesn't work, then you've always got your backups as well. Because remember, this is, this is only for part of it. This is, this is not a standalone system. You want redundancy and other capabilities. Um, uh, let's see. It's uh, from Leonard. Ooh, oh, that's cool. Uh, worms for a feedstock. Yeah, that uh, vermiculture. Yes. Okay. Oh, wow. They can digest styrofoam. That's pretty heavy duty. Uh, yeah, that would be, vermiculture would be a great, that's a really good point. Now that would be mostly aerobic. You'd need to keep them, uh, living or, or with, with, with some oxygen. Um, but yeah, the peacocks love them. Yeah, that, that's, that's what you feed to your chickens. There you go. That, that's a classic example. Thank you for bringing that up of, of, of increasing the diversity within your system so that you get a, a greater preponderance or, uh, not preponderance, you get more materials that you can work with that provide an overall healthy ecosystem because, you know, material in, material out. Uh, so that, that, that's, uh, thank you very much, Leonard, for putting that up there. That's great. Uh, provide an aquatic science workshop in Central East Florida. Oh, that's cool. Send me an email, please. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to chat. Um, and probably Matt and Steli would too, because we're all consultants working together. Um, let's see. Uh, the oxygenation of the water, like in freshwater systems. Yeah, well, uh, Chris, yeah, well, once again, we uh, we, we promote uh, additional oxygen through uh, recirculation and then a good atmospheric transfer, so, um, or turnover. So essentially, you know, as you're cycling the water, just make sure it's hitting the open atmosphere. Uh, usually we'll send it over something like a weir so that there's a very thin film of water that it has to go up and over, and that allows for a very efficient oxygen transfer. It ends up being like a carburetor essentially, you know, where you got, you're, you're, you're exchanging uh, gases, your exhaust gases for your, your, your oxygen. Um, so circulation. So uh, nice thing about that is it takes a very low power pump to be able to run and keep a system like that uh, well oxygenated um, with, without having to add any chemical amendments or anything like that. And in an emergency, if things really got bad um, and your system went down, that is something that you could potentially um, you know, run by uh, hand crank or wind, uh, wind power, something along those lines. So there's other mechanical means where you could go ahead and just transfer energy to it to keep the water circulating without having to use your batteries, uh, say, for instance. But yes, that's an absolutely, that, that's a critical point that an aerobic wetland, you want to keep it aerobic. Now, if it should crash and go anaerobic, uh, we found that just get it stirring again and it'll set itself back to aerobic within an hour or two. Uh, it really doesn't take that long for it, even during a full crash, for it to bounce back, which is the nice thing about uh, wetlands, because oxygen is so good at providing energy, essentially, without getting too deep into it. Um, all right, I'm all, uh, I think, I, yeah, that was everything, and uh, we're 
definitely a little over time. So uh, please send me an email. Uh, check us out on YouTube. Um, please like and subscribe and click and all that stuff. And Carly, thank you so much. Uh, Katie, also, thank you for setting this up uh, in, in, in the early days and getting me hooked up there with Carly. Uh, and I hope to talk to you all again uh, later on at some point. Thank you so much, Colin. It was great. Have a good night, everyone.